Good morning. Good morning. I very much like that Steve took what the devil meant to distract us and threw it right back in his face. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Um, I have a, asked a pastor question. I'm going to read uh, real quick to you. Uh, the question is, what is the pride of life? Uh, I'm going to read to you out of uh, the book of 1 John. So you kind of get the context in which this is used. Um, 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 15. John is writing, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Um, this is the only time in all of Scripture that this phrase is used. Okay, pride of life. But there's two things that came to my mind as, as I was reading through this. Um, the Garden of Eden. Let's, let's take a look at what happens in the Garden of Eden real quick. If you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Don't worry, Dan. I'm going to get you up here. I won't take long. Um, So, Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes into the garden, he's talking with Eve, and he's, he's beguiling her, and, and it's interesting because, you know, when the devil comes to tempt us, he always has a grain of truth in what he says, but it's wrapped around in a lie. And in verse 6, we read, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Now, in 1 John, we had the three, three things listed. Do you, you remember what they were? It, was, it wasn't just the pride of life, it was... What? Come on, have courage. Speak loud. <laughs> lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, lust of the flesh, do you notice the first thing that's noted here? The tree was good for food. Satisfying the flesh. Satisfying that, that part of us that is, you know, this physical thing that I'm standing up here in front of you with untucked and all. We need to get longer strings on these things. <laughs> okay? Um, the second thing is it was a delight to the eyes. Hmm. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. And then the third thing. The tree was to be desired to make one wise. Now, we look at this and we go, okay, well, what's, what's wrong with that? I mean, what's wrong with wanting to be wise? Solomon was wise. Yeah, Solomon's life didn't end up so good. Um, it wasn't so much that she was seeking wisdom, was it? What was she seeking really in, in what was going on here? To be like God. Yeah, equality with God. She wanted to usurp the position that was his alone and place herself there. Okay, and so we see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now let's jump ahead into the New Testament. Jesus is in the wilderness, and he's being tempted. Now, what is Jesus being tempted with? What are the three temptations that come on him? Well, turn the stones to bread. <laughs> the lust of the flesh. Feed yourself. You don't need to fast. God hears your prayers. God knows what's going on. Really, you don't even need to pray all that much because, you know, he knows everything. He knows what you're going to pray anyway. 
He's got it under control. That didn't work, did it? So then, then what does he do? He takes him up to the temple mount, on top of the temple, and he says, throw yourself off. And what does Jesus say? You don't put the Lord your God to the test. And the third thing, he says, look, I'm, I'm showing you all the kingdoms of this world. All of them. Now, second one, I, I think, was lust of, of uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the pride of life. And the third one is also the pride of life because, look, I'm going to give you authority over everyone. Just bow to me. And Jesus says what? Oh, come on, guys. You know the story. What does Jesus tell me? You shall worship your God and him only. Okay? Now, we see three temptations that are laid out in the garden. And she did. And man fed. And the first Adam brought sin into the world. Okay? You see three temptations given in the wilderness. Now, you see this stark contrast? Lay those two in juxtaposition. Okay? You have the garden where everything was given to them. Okay? It was blessed. God would come and walk with Adam in the cool of the evening. And they're tempting, 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 and, and they fall. And now, we have Jesus out in the wilderness, which is in stark contrast to the garden, and he is being tempted. Now, you say, well, okay, how does this answer the pride of life? Well, to be honest with you, I can't give you an exact answer for you. But I will tell you kind of the summary of what it looks like. Essentially, the pride of life can be defined as anything that would exalt self in contradiction to that which God has called us to be. Okay? Do you, I'm going to read that again. The pride of life can be defined as anything that would exalt self in contradiction to that which God has called us to be. Okay? Now, for some of you, that might be your position. <coughs> for some of you, it might be your prosperity. <coughs> for some of you, it might be um, your accomplishments. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you what pride of life is for you, but I will tell you that it's anything that exalts yourself, lifts yourself up, which God despises, and it denies what Christ has called us to in crucifying ourselves, becoming less that he might become more, and dying so that he can live in us. Okay, so if you have anything in your life that is getting in the way of that, it probably is going to fall under pride of life. Now, it, it can even come in the form of humility. Oh, I'm, I'm not good enough to be saved. Who is? <coughs> really? Tell me one person that was good enough to be saved. I, I hear, honestly, I hear this a lot. God doesn't want me. The, the horrible things I've done. Yeah, that's why the price he paid was the ultimate price, the cross. N no other price was sufficient. Okay? So, uh, I don't know, there was no name on this question. I've given a little bit more information in the, the writing here, so I will leave it up front for you three to come and get it after the service. So, today, the day has come. Pastor Dan is here. And I am turning the service over at this point to him. We're just going to let Dan come and share. Uh, Dan and April, um, he is the family pastor and now the youth pastor. Um, and and he, that's good because he's got a big family and he's got a lot of youth. So um, he's going to come and at uh, Cornerstone Church down in Hamilton, he's going to come and share with us what God has laid on his heart. So, Dan, here you go. Oh, go Dan. Go Dan. <laughs> Do you mind if I raise this up a little, Glenn? Absolutely not. <laughs> I do. So, um,. Yeah, thank you for that. I have, a, I have a profound respect for the privilege of preaching at a, a church other than your home church. I know it's not always easy for a, a pastor to, to step back and let somebody else 
um, preach a message that God has laid on their heart. So thank you to, to uh, Pastor Glenn for allowing me to do that. Um, I'm also uh, Glenn and Christy's neighbor as well, so we've, we've had the, the privilege of being next to them for the last year or so, and, and it's been a huge blessing. So um, I apologize to whoever's row we obliterated this morning. <laughs> we, we have uh, our, our three children. My eldest is, is doing some ministry at, at Cornerstone this morning, and then we have our two foster children with us as well. So I, I, I have a profound respect for... Uh, uh, Christian's church rows as well. I know, I know sometimes those are hard to, hard to change. Um, so if you can turn in your Bibles this morning to uh, John 14. This is going to be our primary passage this morning. If I'm not loud enough, just holler, raise your hand, and we'll go from there. So starting in verse 19. It says, in a little while, the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me, these are two amazing promises that we're going to look at this morning. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. These are, these are some of my most, <laughs> my favorite passages in scripture. John, John 13, John 14, 15, 16, 17. I, I, I love the final words of Christ. He says here, because I live, you will live also. Jesus Christ was, was prophesying about being raised from the dead and, and the newness of life, 1 Corinthians 5, 17, that, that we also will be made this new creature in Christ. We, we too would be raised from the dead and brought to newness of life. A, a beautiful promise. He says, you will know in that day that, that I am in my Father, and I am in you, and you are in me. We are in Christ. We as Christians have this amazing privilege, as, as Peter says, of being his, his purchased possession, his his chosen people, his royal priesthood. We, we are redeemed by the blood of Christ and, and purchased by him. Jesus Christ is living and reigning in us. And, and Paul in Colossians 1, if you'll flip over there with me. This might feel a little bit like a sword drill at some points this morning, so apologize for that. Colossians chapter 1. We'll start in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. I have become its servant according to God's administration that was given to me for you to make God's message fully known. Verse 26, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to us, to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ coming, ruling, and reigning in our hearts. This mystery that was, that was kept hidden for ages, and then at the, at the coming of Christ, with his death and his resurrection, him sending his Holy Spirit in us, he now rules and reigns in our hearts. And he is our, our hope of glory. So back to John 14. We're going to look at these, these two promises. So, two promises in this chapter, in verse 21. We will be loved by my Father. We will be loved by the Father. And then two, Jesus Christ will manifest himself to us, reveal himself to us. What a privileged creation we are. <clears throat> that we, one of the greatest longings, I believe, in the human heart is to, is to know that we're loved. You look at, at any child out there, they, they need that, that love and security from mom and dad. If they don't, if they don't get that, they're, they're damaged, oftentimes for life. We, too, are made with this God-sized hole in our heart. And one of the promises from Christ for us in this passage is that we will be loved by the Father. We'll have that, that security, that comf comfort, that, that confidence 
And then number two, Jesus Christ will reveal himself to us. So let's, we're going to look through some different places in John 13, 14, and 15 today. I'm going to kind of bounce around in that a little bit. So let's remember the, the context of these last words of Jesus. So days before Luke 19, Jesus comes up, he approaches Jerusalem on, on a donkey. He, he's, he's getting praised. People are laying palm branches and their, their robes before him. He rides in on the colt. Luke tells us actually that he saw Jerusalem and he weeps. It's one of the several places in Scripture that we see that, that Jesus weeps. And I believe that Jesus didn't weep because he was a, afraid of the cross. He was afraid of the, the pain or the torture that he, that he knew that he was going to experience. I, I believe that as, as you know, Math, Matthew 9 he, when he looked at the crowds and he, he was moved with compassion, I believe he had you and me in mind. He, he, understand, he understood that his mission was, was to save us. And he, he sees these people, this mass group of people, worshiping him. And he's broken in heart because he, he knows the price that's going to be paid. It, he was going to take on our, our hell, eternal separation from God for us. And here all these people are expecting Messiah to... Maybe to overthrow Rome, to set up some sort of government that, that, that would fix things. But no, that's, that's not what Jesus has on his heart. He has you and me forever on his mind. Scripture tells us that as he approached, he, he wept. He was going to take on the, the very wrath of God against our sin. In John 13, this is his final night. This is Passover night. This is that moment where time is ticking away before his, before his execution. And I, I believe that John, John shows us a, some pretty amazing insight into Jesus' heart. In, in John chapter 13, you can flip back there. Gives us a window into what Jesus is feeling. Starting in verse 1, it says, Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that this hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. Now by the time of supper, the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going to God. There wasn't any question in Jesus' mind who he was, or what was what was coming. He, he knew very well. And as scripture tells us, his face was set as flint towards the cross. He, he, he was on a mission. And verse 4 is an absolutely stunning verse. It says, So he got up from supper, laid aside, laid aside his robe, took a towel and tied it around himself. The king of the universe here humbles himself. Humbles himself to the very, very lowliest of positions for the sake of his disciples. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and dry them with the towel tied around him. And of course, Peter, who's always good for a, good for a question, he goes, why, why are you doing this? Peter's one of my favorite characters in Scripture as well. And, and Jesus says, if, if I don't do this, you have, you have no part with me. Jesus goes on and he, he says in verse 12, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his robe, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and this is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. And sometimes the, the hardest words in scriptures are the smallest. Like if, or as, in this case. As I have done for you, so you do for one another. That's taking it to a whole nother level. He's asking us to cry, to, to love as, as Christ loved. This is, this is not easy love. This is supernatural, agape love of Jesus Christ. And he asks us to do as he has done. I, I think what Jesus in part did here is he stripped away he kind of peeled back the layers of the onion, if you will, of what his disciples were thinking. His disciples up to this point had bickered and argued about who was going to be the greatest. They, they still, at this point, I believe, thought that Jesus was going to rule over Rome. And, that, and that's 
that's the kingdom that was going to come. They, they had totally missed the fact that sin was ruling and reigning over them, and they needed Christ to go to the cross. And so Jesus, he, he humbles himself to the, to the point of the, the lowliest of tasks, and starts to break through the walls. And, and this, I think, sets up the next few chapters of John. These are the last words of Jesus Christ. This is, this is lapel time. This is where Jesus gets down and he has got his disciples' attention. And they're finally realizing that he's going to go to the cross. And now they're ready for some, some meat. They're finally going to hear and, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. This reminds me of, of that, that father-in-law talk that you have when you, you ask your wife you know, for her hand in marriage. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that, but that was probably the scariest day that I ever had. <laughs> you know, and and I, I will remember every minute of that for the rest of my life, I'm sure. This is like the father-in-law talk on steroids. Jesus is, he's, he's, he's dying. He knows it. He knows what his mission is, and he's trying to convey that to his disciples. In doing that, he now washes his disciples' feet, and he has their intention. And that sets up the rest of, of John 13, 14, and, and the rest of it. So Judas, <laughs> Judas betrays him. And then in verse 31, it says, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Children, I am with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews where I am going, you cannot come. So now I tell you. And verse, verse 34 is, is what I want to point out to you. He says, a new command I give you. Love one another. Again, here's this, this little word, as. Just as I have loved you you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The distinguishing mark of believers is going to be their love for one another. The world's going to look at it and see, and see the presence and person of Jesus Christ working through them, loving <coughs> one another. It's a, it's a beautiful commandment. And it's also, I think, the commandment that is, <laughs> if we don't do it, the pride of life, as Pastor Glenn, that, that gets in the way. It's, it's the one command that we can't do in our own power. God calls us to do it, and so it needs to produce in us humility and absolute, utter dependence of, on, on God. I believe that the, the enemy wants to target this commandment. He wants to single this commandment out and, and get us as Christians to, to refuse it in one way or the other, whether it be the pride of life or, you know, that's hard. It's often hardest to love the people that we're nearest to, right? And my wife, yeah. not her. She's the exception to that. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys know I'm being sarcastic. I think the seriousness in Jesus' voice and his incredible love that he just demonstrated as he washed his feet is starting to heal through. God, God was moving. And Jesus needed to speak in such a way that, and act in such a way that he took those preconceived ideas about the kingdom of God that his disciples had. And he had to shed those so that they could hear this new commandment. Jesus repeats this, by the way, in John 15, 12. So John 15, 12 says, This is my command, love one another as I have loved you. Verse 17, this is what I command you, love one another. He, re he repeats himself. I can't think of another time where Jesus repeats himself in such a direct manner. This is of utmost importance to his disciples. If they don't do this, they're not going to make it. The world's not going to know. It hinged on this. As he said in, in Matthew 22, Two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And what's the other one? Love your, love, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus now boils these two commandments down into one. He says, love one another. Love one another. Now, why, why, why does he take the two commandments and make it one? And what I believe is that after Pentecost, Jesus Christ 
the Holy Spirit is now ruling and reigning on our hearts. And I don't know your name, but when I love TJ, I'm loving Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in TJ. When I love him, I love him. It's a, it's a beautifully new and profound statement. And the disciples up to this point haven't realized that the problem wasn't the external kingdom. The problem was the internal kingdom. Sin was reigning on their hearts. Jesus Christ was going to crush that on the cross. He was going to nail it to the cross. And he now was going to reign on the inside. And it was profoundly new and profoundly beautiful. So he repeats this command. And it's, it's, I, thought about, I thought about this as probably a poor analogy, but we have six children and we, we drive the, the Dan van, one of my... One of my friends calls it the swagger wagon. Okay? It's nothing pretty. But I, I can't think how many times I have to tell my kids to buckle up. Anybody, anybody relate to that? If you have young kids, you have to repeat that like every single time. Husbands. Yeah, husbands. <laughs> Absolutely, husbands. Okay? Jesus repeats this commandment to them because of its importance. He's putting an emphasis on it. If they don't do this, they're not going to make it. They're not going to glorify the Lord. So let's flip into chapter 14. And we'll read, the, we'll read where we started off again. Verse 19. In a little while the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. We are united with Jesus Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. He says here, the one who has my commands and keeps them. Again, what's his command? He just laid it out for them. Love one another and keeps them. This is the one who loves me. It, it's not enough. Sometimes I think we think as Christians that we're going to pick up on the commands of God and be Christian just by osmosis. You know, just by being around wonderful people. And certainly we might live a little bit better at life, but that's, that's, that's not the point. Jesus Christ has to transform us on the inside. He has to become our Savior and our Lord. It's not enough just to hear his commands, but he asks us here to, to keep them. James, James 1 says we can't just be hearers of the word. We have to be doers of the word. Hearers and doers. Matthew 7, 24, at the, at the end of the, the parable about the, the wise man, he says the, the wise man is him who hears and obeys my teachings. And he, I would liken him to a wise man who has built his house on the, on the rock. But the foolish man is the one who hears and then doesn't obey. You just, you just let it go. And him, he's, Jesus calls him a, a fool. We, we hear these words and we obey them. This, this word keep, I was, Glenn had mentioned to me that he was going through a series on spiritual warfare and, it's, and the Lord had kind of tapped me about sharing this scripture with you. I was like, oh, you know, Lord, I'm, I don't really know this congregation at all, so how, how does this fit? This word keep here is the word tereo, which is a, it's a military term. It means to keep, to guard, to, to protect, to, to be a watchman over. It's got that the Old Testament context being a, a watchman on a wall. He says, you, you hear this command and you, you keep them, you, you defend it. That implies to me that this is a command that's going to come under attack. It's going to be something that our enemy is going to strive to use against us, strive to, to get us to, to bite and devour one another. This is a, a military term. Keep this. This is something that we have to defend. At the end of the day, if Satan can come into our bodies, regardless of what body we're in, and can divide us, can separate us, can get us to take this command that Jesus Christ gives us and, and throw it out for whatever reason. And sometimes we get really good at justifying that. He's divided us. And all of a sudden the world looks at us and, and they there's there's nothing there for me. You know, they, they say that they, they love, they say that they know Christ, but then they don't love one another and it doesn't make sense. 
And it, it really shouldn't. You know, we shouldn't expect anything different from the world if that's the case. We, we can't leave our post. We, we can't take our eye off the necessity and the, the foundation that love is. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love is the greatest. Okay? Faith, hope, but the greatest of all is, is love. I, I, just to share a little bit about my story, I have a... Um, I, I work with a couple of Christians at work. I am at Bitter Drug. I'm a pharmacist down there, and I, I work with about 15 people. And um, one of the things I've, I've found is that the Lord has opened up opportunities a lot this last year. But a fair number of my fellow coworkers are churched individuals, people that, that have been in church at one time or another. I, I, I work with one gentleman who was a deacon a long time ago and now doesn't go to church at all. Um, and he, he left. He hasn't really told me fully yet, but it was a financial disagreement of some sort that separated two people in church, and now he doesn't go. I work with a technician who um, was gossiped about, or at least she feels that way in some way, shape, or form, and now she and all her family won't go. And when I try to share, when I try to love on them, there's some barriers there. There's some resistance to that because of what, what they've seen, what they've experienced. And what I want to submit to you is that we as Christians need to keep this new command, this primary command in front of us all the time. When we, and I'll, I'll show you this in John 17 later, but when we love one another, it's intensely evangelical. It's a, it's a beautiful Thing. And when we don't, it does the opposite. It's very dangerous. And that's because of the, the emphasis that Jesus put on it and the emphasis that Satan puts on it in attacking. So regardless of which church body we're in, let us love one another. Let, us, let it not be said of us that, that, that we didn't shrink back, as Hebrews said, but we persevered in love. So Romans 13, let's... let's Look elsewhere in the New Testament where this comes up. By the way, the, the book that Pastor Glenn read out of this morning, 1 John, is almost all about love. Okay, the alternative, if we don't submit ourselves to this command, 1 John says, is that we, we actually hate. Right. If we don't love our brother whom we see, how can we love God whom we don't see? And he, he goes on, and, and Satan gets in that, and then he makes us a murderer. It's, it's an amazing thing. So if you, if you have time for that this week, get in 1 John and read that. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. But Romans chapter 13, we'll start in verse 8. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment, all are summed up by this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to be free, brothers. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but rather serve one another through love, for the entire law is filled up in this one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by each other. Colossians 3.14, above all, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start in verse 11. So this is talking about how we are called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one, one God and Father of all, and how grace is given to each one. In verse 11, he says, And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and then in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. 
Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Hmm. When we come together as God's beautiful design as, as individuals, Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in, in, in us, when we come together as a body of Christ, it is a supernatural thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a God thing. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that he, he knits us together according to his good pleasure. <clears throat> Church is God's idea. Yeah. It's God's design. It's God's tool to reach this world. It's, 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 it's not just for us. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the way in which God works and, and impacts and, and reaches into this fallen world. And he tells us here, he says, as each part builds itself up in love, the, the promises here, verse 13, are that we'll have unity in the faith, we'll have fullness of Jesus Christ, pretty amazing promise, we'll be growing into the fullness of Jesus Christ. That, that means to me, as, as people look at, at your church, you reflect more and more <coughs> of the image of who he is. And it's more and more compelling to David because he's exceedingly beautiful, exceedingly wonderful, beyond anything else that we can describe or compare. Verse 15, he promises that we'll, we'll grow into this. The Ephesian church was famous for their love for one another. And yet, Paul, throughout his letter, he, he reminds them of the importance of being together. And in verse 115, he says... Uh, this is why ever since I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayer. I, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In verse 19 of chapter 2, he says, So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with, with who? with the saints, fellow citizens with the saints, and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. The whole building, being put, put together by him, grows into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. You also are being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. And then in 3.18, and we'll, sorry, I'm doing the pastor thing, we say a verse and then we tend to back up a little bit and read, read more. But in verse 14, it says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner man through his spirit, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, and, and this is the, the part that really stood out to me this week, being rooted and firmly established in, in love, being rooted in grounded, you're, you're planted on this, and firmly established in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love. And so in, in Paul's prayer here, he understands the importance of the body of Christ. He's knit us together to grow us into the fullness of who he is. And as he does that, we experience more and more and more and more of who Jesus Christ is. And it, it becomes something that, that I believe is, is meant to blow our mind and, and be a, a, a beautiful thing. Love one another. Rugged individualism. We live in western Montana. We kind of have this pull, your up, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality, and that has no place in our churches. We, we were meant to be with one another, and it's only together that we experience the fullness of his love. So, so back to John 14. Let's read again what, what Jesus said. The one who keeps 
again, guards, defends, protects. The one who keeps this command is the one who loves me. And you will be loved by my Father. You will experience heights of love that you've never experienced before, depths of love that cleanse you in the deepest part, widths of love that trump every fiery trial, every distraction, every confusing circumstance. You're going to experience the love of God the Father, and, and you'll be able to cry out. His Spirit will testify with your spirit. You'll cry out, Abba, Father. And this love is going to be inexhaustible and new every day, by the way. Number two, the second promise, I will reveal myself to him. I'll, he'll show himself. He'll reveal. He'll disclose himself to him. We'll, it's, I think of like a, a diamond turning in the sun. You know, we'll see more and more of Jesus Christ as we love one another. And it's, it's going to be new to us and wonderful in, in ways that we didn't expect. So Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the other Judas, asked a really good question. He says, Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And it's a, it's a great question, he's, but he's missing the point. Jesus Christ was going to be in him. And, and as he says earlier, he was going to send the counselor, and the counselor, the Holy Spirit, was going to be in him as well. There's a, another beautiful promise in here, and I, I didn't realize this until I was going through this this week. In verse 23, it says, Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. Again, we see that beautiful promise. And we will come to him and make our home with him. The Trinity is going to be dwelling inside of you, making their home with you. God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, ruling and reigning in your heart. And this word home is the same, same word home that he uses to, to describe where he was going. I'm, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. It's, it's the same word for mansion. God's going to have this mansion in your heart where he's going to dwell in, in beauty and power and, and glory. And it, it reminds me of what, what Paul says to the Corinthians. He, he tells them five or six times, do you not know? Do you not know that you're the temple of God? You're, you're made to be a dwelling place for him, for the king of glory to come in. When Jesus gave himself on, on the cross and when he was risen from the dead, he did, in fact, overthrow a kingdom. He overthrew this kingdom. Mm -hmm. He overthrew that, that pride of life. He destroyed it. He nailed it to the cross. He overthrew sin, and he did, in fact, set up his home. You know, he set up his home in you and I, and we receive him by, by faith. He is risen, and he is Lord, and he dwells here. <laughs> because of that, I, I think we're the most privileged of all creation. I, I, had, I was sharing some of this with a, with a man this last, this last winter, and um, he was uh, a little bit critical about me emphasizing love so much. And uh, um, I, one of the things that kind of bugs me is, is the world's perspective on love and, and the biblical different definition. There's two totally different things, okay? So when I say the word love, think about it in terms of a cross. <clears throat> Think about it in terms of Jesus Christ, agape loving us, giving himself for us. And that's the kind of love that's biblically right. And he, he, it said that I was over overemphasizing this and, and that maybe it was too myopic that we get too church-centered and, and not community-oriented enough and we, we don't reach out. And I, I honestly don't think that's true. Christ said that he will build his church right? And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. He was going to build his church. He wasn't going to build me. He was going to save me. He was going to be my savior. He was going to be my Lord. But then he was going to knit me in a church and he was going to build me together with you. And we as an army then were meant to glorify Christ and storm, storm the very gates of hell. We were not meant to do this on our own. In John, John chapter 15, verse 9. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to back up to verse 7. 
that if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. You have an amazing prayer life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus Christ dwelling in you. Mm. Verse 8, my Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. When you keep the words of Jesus Christ to love one another, you will bear much fruit. You will. And that's a promise. You're going to be able to have enter into the beautiful privilege with Christ of, as, as Paul said in, in Corinthians, sharing with them glory to glory the face of Jesus Christ and having this ministry of reconciliation <coughs> and persuading men to love God. You're going to be used in the kingdom of God and you are going to bear fruit. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. When we keep this command, He's going to explode in us His presence, His, His power, His joy. He goes on to promise that. I tell you these things so that your joy may be full. He's going to explode our prayer life, explode the fruit that we bear, because it's not us doing it, it's Jesus Christ living in us, performing his work. In John 17, and this is what I want to close with this morning. John 17, Jesus is praying for us in verse 20. He says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I and am you. What, what an amazing amount of unity he's praying for us there. He's praying that just as Jesus Christ and the Father are one, we too, with one another, would be one. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I and am you. May they also be one in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be one. Again, he's praying for us. May they be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they may be made completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. When we love one another and fulfill that command, he builds us together. He builds unity. He builds faith. He builds... <laughs> Just a fellowship, a koinonia, fellowship of the Spirit. And he glorifies his great name. And when the world looks on it, when they, when they see that, it's compelling. It's, it's beautiful because it's, it's him. It's not us. The world looks and they see sinners made perfect, made complete, made into the fullness of Jesus Christ by the saving work of, of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it's, it's something that is amazingly, amazingly compelling. And so I'll, I, I just want to close by, again, thanking you for allowing me to, to be here today. And thank you for Pastor Glenn for inviting me. Um, and I want to pray for you. So let's pray. <coughs> Father God, thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word. Thank you for what you've called us to, Father. I thank you for, uh, thank you for commanding us, God. Thank you that you're totally worthy of being our Lord, God. You, you know what, you know what you're doing, Father God. And you command us to love one another, and Father, we in humility this morning come before you, God, in complete dependence, and say, Lord, help us in that. God, work in us mightily. God, compel us by the love of Jesus Christ. God, that we would do this command. We would keep it. We would defend it, God, regardless of what cost it may happen to us personally. Father, do this work in us, God, that we may be one and that you may be glorified. Father, we pray with Christ and we intercede with the Holy Spirit this morning and pray, God, that you would bring unity. God, unity in Jesus Community Church. Unity in Cornerstone Church, unity in all the churches in our valley, Father, that you would be ultimately and supremely glorified. And Father, we pray this 
so that people may look on our churches and know, Jesus Christ, that you live. Know that you, know that you reign. Know that you can save. God, that you're mighty to save. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Dan is the first of a number of men that I'm going to ask to come and speak at our church. And there's a, a reason behind this. Um, <clears throat> the Church of Christ, his body that is present here on this earth, is not limited to these four walls. Or six. No. This building. <laughs> and... We are approaching the time when uh, the freedom that we have as Christians is going to be taken away. And it's going to come at a cost to be a Christian. And we need to understand that for a long time we've majored on the minors and minored in the majors. Um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes... Actually, I'm going to I'm going to turn there real quick. First Corinthians 14. Um, Paul has just finished giving us a definition of the love that God has for us. Um, Dan touched on um, the love that we have. We only get because God loves us. That, that takes a little pressure off. Because if I have to love you guys with my own abilities, we're all in trouble. Okay? If you have to love me with your own power, I'm in trouble. Okay? We love because God loves us. And he's just gone through this definition, this explanation of what love is, what it looks like, what it isn't. And then he starts chapter 14 with this. He says, Pursue love and earnestly <coughs> desire spiritual gifts. Okay? And we've kind of flipped that in the church. Now, we want our way. And, and we're so caught up in looking at the differences between our fellowship and their fellowship. Okay? That right there is our first mistake because it's neither ours or theirs. It's his. Okay? It's his body. And we're the ones that are made into that body. We're grafted in. Okay? So when I'm uh, asking these pastors to come and share with us because I want our scope to be beyond what happens here. We've got to start looking broader. Okay? Because when the church starts uh, to be persecuted, two things happen. One, those that are not of the body fall away. They're gone. Okay? But, historically, from Acts, from the founding of the church, whenever the church is persecuted, it grows. And immediately you see people falling off. Man, it ain't that worth that much to me. But then as people see the true church, the true believers who are loving those that are persecuting them and doing good to those who despitefully use them, they start wanting to be a part of that. Okay? So, um, Dan, I thank you very much for coming and sharing the word. Um, you know, it amazes me how many people really get hung up on this love thing. That's what it's all about. You know? 1 Corinthians 13. You can have all the gifts, but if you don't have love, it's nothing. It's nothing. 